So welcome to this research talk series, which are organized to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. Today's uh, talk will be given by, by Michael Schredel, who's um, been a member of IASD since 1990. Uh, he has also worked in a sleep laboratory of the Central Institute of Mental Health uh, in Mannheim, Germany, from 1990. And he's published widely on various topics related to dreams. Uh, dream recall, dream content analysis. He studied nightmares, sleep disorders. Uh, he, he actually also consults adult patients who have uh, issues with nightmares. And many of uh, uh, people who publish know him also as the editor of the International Journal of, of Dream Research. And today's talk will be about nightmares. So what are nightmares? Who are the people who are most likely to have nightmares? Why do we have nightmares? Or why some people are more likely to have them? Um, should we worry about having nightmares? Or are they just a normal feature of dreaming? Uh, and if we need to worry about nightmares, can we do anything about them? So can we treat nightmares? Michael, you're welcome. Thanks, Katja. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so we can start the series. So everyone is welcome to listen to the research topic of nightmares. And I wanted to start with a slide, if it works, uh, with some kind of a timeline from the beginning of ISD uh, to the adulthood of ISD. Uh, just to mention a few researchers who are involved in ISD or often visited conferences and are one of the key players uh, in nightmare research. Uh, this is Ernest Hartmann. Uh, he wrote a book uh, and did a lot of research. Anne Weisman did very nice uh, workshops on the ISD conferences about changing nightmares. You will hear, uh, <clears throat> hear about this nightmare therapy form. Uh, Barry Krako from Albuquerque, New Mexico, was one of the first um, who empirically uh, evaluated nightmare therapies. And uh, Tora Nielsen, I think it was also at the beginning of the ISD, and Ross Levine were one of the theoretical researchers developing a very complex model uh, of nightmare etiology. And uh, 2016, I was involved in that uh, as as uh, as, a, as all, uh, and also a very active German research group in organizing the first two uh, specific nightmare conferences, international nightmare conferences. And I did forget to mention Karin Katrin Belitsky, who was also very active in the nightmare research in the early days. So let's start. What are nightmares? Nightmares, uh, if you look at the ISSD, it's the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, as extended extreme dysphoric and well-remembered dreams that usually involve threats to survival, security, and physical integrity. Uh, this is a slide or from uh, the, the aforementioned publication from Levin and Nielsen. So you have an idea that the dreaming is some kind of a continuum from normal dreaming to the most intense form of nightmares. These are typical post-traumatic nightmares. Uh, these are events that the person really have experienced in their waking life, and it's repeated one-to-one -one in their dreams. And you see as a middle group, there are the so-called idiopathic nightmares. These are not trauma-related, like uh, falling or being chased or something like that. Uh, so you have a light kind of a continuum of normal, nice dreaming to the kind of very uh, intense and uh, negative dreams. Another issue that's uh, important, especially if in, in sleep medicine, is the differentiation between nightmares and night terrors. Night terrors are non-REM parasomnias because they occur out of non-REM sleep, uh, typically occur in the first part of the night. But uh, if you have witnessed it or the experiences of yourself, it's a very, very intense uh, thing. Uh, the people who have night terrors can really cry very loudly so really the whole house is hearing it. Uh, but typically, uh, the persons, if they are soothed and go back to bed, typically have a low or almost no recall 
of the um, uh, episode. So this non-REM parasomnia is different because it's not a sleep stage or sleep phenomenon, but they are in a partly awakened state. So it's uh, in, in, in the US nomenclature, it's also called disorders of arousal. So this is a little bit different, and I mentioned it in this case because the nightmare therapies that are evolve, that have been developed and are very effective for nightmares doesn't work at all for uh, night terrors because it's a very different phenomenon. So the nightmares typically occur in the second half of the night. If the person wakes up from a nightmare, he's also he or she is remembering a full story typically. Uh, and uh, the and the anxiety re um, the reaction to the nightmare. We did a study on that. is is um, astonishing small. So the heart rate goes only up for uh, an average of about seven beats per minute. So uh, whereas in the night terror you can have a heartbeat from sixty sleep to one hundred and eighty. So it's a, just much more intense. But it's uh, uh, in, um, important to differentiate these two phenomenon if you're looking for therapy and coping with these issues. Um, then from the clinical standpoint, it's not about nightmares, but uh, about nightmares that occur as, as often and cause clinically significant distress to the person. So they have nightmares, of course, but they're Nightmares have to occur in a way or in a frequency that the person is severely um, hampered or in, in his waking life really distressed. For example, anxieties to fall asleep because nightmares might reoccur or uh, thinking about nightmares during the day or have negative effects after waking up in the morning that the mood is uh, disrupted or something like that. And this is a, a clinical diagnosis, and clinical diagnosis uh, typically are uh, um, important if you want to have a treatment that is paid by the insurance companies. At least in Germany, it works very well. So if you have a diagnosis, you can go to a professional and get some therapy for your diagnosed uh, disorder. And for nightmares, the typical cutoff we use is uh, some kind of nightmares once a week or more often. These are really the frequent nightmare sufferers who uh, have all, main, most often also problems when they have these the nightmares this frequent. So how often do nightmares occur? Um, as you see, uh, if you talk about nightmares once a year or something like that, uh, then most of the persons uh, have experience nightmares in their lives. Um, and even the nightmare disorder you see in, in, in representative samples, it's about two to five percent of the persons who suffer from nightmares, frequent nightmares. And if you look at specific groups like patients with mental disorders, the frequency of the nightmare disorders really goes up at about 30 percent. And of course, the most frequent group having nightmares is the post-traumatic stress disorder group, uh, it's about 70% of those persons suffer from nightmares. So what are the typical nightmare themes? Um, there's uh, a few studies out there, but I think we, we did the only representative study uh, in Germany, and there's the typical uh, nightmare themes in this sample where falling dreams, being chased, being paralyzed, or being late, or close uh, persons uh, disappear or die. So you see the, the per percentage of participants saying they had these nightmares in the last uh, few months. So how can we explain nightmare content? So it's just an idea. Uh, if you have more questions about that, we can uh, discuss this in the discussion section. But uh, if you have, for example, the falling dream, I think uh, every every one of you will agree that no one experienced falling in his or her waking life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to watch this talk. So why do we have falling dreams? It's an interesting question. And the basic idea is uh, that nightmares, especially nightmares and anxiety dreams, are dramatized versions of everyday waking life emotions. 
So falling is a, is a dramatized version of the feeling of helplessness because in a falling dream, you fall down and the only thing you know is that you are going to crash on the ground and will be dead. So you can't do anything about it. So it's a dramatized version of helplessness or being chased, anxiety, having fear and running away is avoidance behavior. Killing someone in a dream is also very interesting uh, because we had some uh, data on that that persons who are aggressive in waking life, normal aggressive, not uh, excessive aggressive, so, so the normal aggressive feelings of everyday life can be dramatized in dreams of killing someone. Or the typical examination dreams that you're worrying about, whether the performance you just give, like giving a talk or something like that, is okay with the others and the other things you don't have any experience and you shouldn't do that and somebody else should do it, like Tony Satra, for example. So these are dreams that um, dream topics that reflect everyday emotions, but in a dramatized version. I think uh, in my clinical experience, this is for many people very helpful because many people ask, why do I have, do I have this kind of extreme uh, graphic, sometimes very graphic dreams, uh, horrible dreams? And if you have this idea in, in mind, then it's uh, much more easier to accept nightmares. And the next issue is why we have nightmares. And uh, I think there's something uh, is um, might be genetic. I think the Finnish group is still working on a on a genome wide association study. Uh, looking forward if it's if it will be published in the next years, centuries, or something like that. But it's a lot of work because you need a lot some time, some kind of thousand or more nightmare sufferers to do this. And uh, the concept, uh, it's also like a trade concept uh, that was developed by Ernest Hartmann or at least uh, put together by Ernest Hartmann is called thin boundaries. And this is a very interesting concept because it's uh, that creative, sensitive, uh, and um, we also looked at high processing sensitivity that these persons are more prone to nightmares than others. Uh, so this is a factor that can uh, should be taken into account. And it's also from my clinical viewpoint that it's important that you also mention that having nightmares doesn't have only downsides, but also have upsides because creative and imaginative and empathic are also very uh, good uh, traits. So it's good that you have a balance at the night, the, not only the negative sides of being sensitive. And we also have the data on that stress uh, in studies or uh, professional life or in private life. It's increasing nightmare frequency and persons who have experienced trauma can even, can even have not a fully blown uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but just as a just uh, also increased nightmare frequency and even don't have nightmares. Uh, that are related to the trauma. So they, it can increase also other nightmare topics. And uh, for many anxiety disorders, there's another factor working in the, especially if you look at the chronic nightmare stuff, uh, it's called uh, avoidance behavior, or in this case, cognitive avoidance. If the person say, I try to forget the dream as soon as possible or the nightmare, and I want, don't want to do anything about, I don't want to, to look at these anxieties in a closer look, um, then the then uh, anxieties can stabilize themselves. So, and you will see uh, that this is, uh, this is a problem. And you will also see that this is the main um, driver for the therapy of nightmares. It's the main point you can access and you can alter and uh, change uh, nightmares. Uh, this is uh, in our sample, you see uh, about 75% of the participants had this kind of cognitive avoidance. I try to forget my nightmares as quickly as possible. It's understandable, but not working. Um, I also want to uh, add a topic. It's uh, I call it attitudes toward nightmares. And uh, it was some kind of stimulated by, uh, by a man who called me in my office. 
And he had an extremely vivid nightmare of being shot. Um, and uh, he had this idea, as this dream was much more vivid than his usual dreams, uh, that this was a precognitive dream or premonition. And he really, every day when he woke up in the morning, he had the fear that this is the last day he experienced and he will be shot. He, was, he had the attitude toward nightmares. He was uh, convinced that this nightmare uh, is predicting the future and that he will be killed. Uh, I tried to uh, reason with him that I've been shot several times and still uh, are very much alive. So I'm had another, I have another attitude toward nightmares. But it was very difficult. And I think he could be classified from a clinical viewpoint as having an anxiety disorder. So we looked at this in an empirical way and we developed a scale measuring uh, attitudes toward nightmares. And you see in this six uh, item scale, there are two items looking at this nightmares predict the future and some nightmares can become reality. Uh, you see on the, on the mean values on the right side that it's not very common because the mean values are not between zero, uh, uh, one and two. Uh, but there are also other attitudes uh, that we found, like nightmares contain clues to unconscious fears. So the person is perfectly well in the, uh, with, or feel wake well in the waking life, but someone is telling there might slumbering or something deep down inside. There are fears you don't know about. And uh, we ask this, uh, we ask a large group uh, about these attitudes, and we find this. It's I think the only only uh, statistical slide in the talk, uh, because I want to show that the, in analysis one, you find the main factor uh, <clears throat> for nightmare distress. How distressed are, are you by your nightmares is, of course, nightmare frequency. That's, that's simple, because if you don't have nightmares, you are not distressed. If you have frequent nightmares, you are feeling distressed. But if you look at analysis two, then we have the same factors, but we also have these beliefs about nightmare scales, buns in this kind, uh, uh, shortened. And you see the nightmare frequency effect is the same, but you have an additional effect of the attitude scale. So the attitudes toward nightmares increase if you think there are conscious fears or predicting the future, like the, like the man who called me, then the distress of nightmares is increasing. So this is a very interesting from a clinical viewpoint that's not all about night having nightmares, but also about how you think about what your nightmares are meaning or what, what they are about. Um, the, next, the next topic uh, that have been looked recently on uh, if nightmares can occur that often that a person suffer and have a clinical diagnosis, the nightmare disorder di diagnosis, how often are they diagnosed? Uh, and you see that in the first study from, from Barry Krako, I mentioned already, um, that 16% of his patients going to the sleep lab of different reasons, not because of nightmares, because of other reasons, sleep rating disorders or something like that, or insomnia, uh, that they have a nightmare disorder. Uh, and before this, he did this study, no one had a diagnosis. And if he, but then he asked his cl clinicians to uh, diagnose the disorder. So it's from zero to 16%. And in our study, you see 1.6 were diagnosed and 13% have frequent nightmares. So there's a large discrepancy about the frequency of nightmare sufferers and the persons who have the diagnosis because as I mentioned, if you have a diagnosis, you can uh, go to a professional and say, I want to have treatment. We also looked at this, how many people actually did go to professionals and ask for help for their nightmares. And you see that's a large uh, population-based sample also from Germany. And you see the top group are the ones with frequent nightmares. And you see one third or even less of the frequent nightmare sufferer groups have once, at least once in their life, uh, asked pro for professional health uh, about their nightmare condition. And uh, this was really shocking us, this finding, because we also asked whether this treatment was helpful for them or not. And you see, seeking professional help 
was only helpful in one third of the cases. And uh, look at when, when you go to the doctor with a broken leg and only one third of the broken leg is healed, okay, then I think the doctor is not going to practice any longer because this is not acceptable. So uh, even if the person sought professional help, uh, the treatment was not very successful. So how does the successful treatment of nightmares look like? The basic idea, of course, is that you, uh, at least if you are in a medical, uh, in a medical profession, that you use drugs, uh, but the typical drugs using to improve uh, mood or improve uh, or lessen anxiety, like antidepressants or benzodiazepines, are not working for nightmares. There is one exception, but it's also discussed. It's a, it's a completely different substance that might be working for PTSD nightmares, but it's not working so far as I know for idiopathic nightmares that are not related to trauma. So the first line treatment uh, is called the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, AASM, uh, is the cognitive behavior treatment form. It's called, and this was developed by Barry Krakow, uh, image re rehearsal therapy. I'm going into that, how this looked like. And uh, of course, another treatment option uh, I will also talk about is lucid dreaming. The cognitive behavioral therapy method or imagery rehearsal therapy is very, very simple. And in my experience, the person uh, with idiopathic nightmares can, they, can do it themselves or with a non-professional helper. It's just recording the dream or with children drawing the dream. Uh, in the next step, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the nightmare person is asked to change the nightmare. Uh, Barry Krakow said, change any way you want. Uh, I'm a little bit more specific because I want to have more not flying away or, or, or hiding or something like that. It should be an active strategy, for example, calling for help or uh, being more assertive in the dream uh, to, um, to successfully cope with the nightmare situation. So in waking life, you use your imagination to think about how you would cope with this nightmare situation. And everything is possible, uh, especially if it's uh, one of the assertive methods. And to have an effect of that, what you are doing in your waking life on dreams, you repeat this kind of treat, uh, this kind of um, imagination of the successful coping uh, over two weeks for about five to ten minutes per day. So this is this is this is it. So this is the whole therapy for nightmares. And um, uh, as I said, Barry Krakow was one of the first who showed that it's really working. And he, in one of his first studies, he had a, a group of idiopathic adult idiopathic nightmare sufferers, and they have long nightmares, chronic nightmares, and used psychotherapy and as I said they have also some of them also uh, have used antidepressants with no effect and he has one treatment session with these persons in small groups I think three to four people in one group uh, was lasting for two and a half hours and uh, these are the results so you see if you look at the nightmares per week then you can see that they have uh, really uh, strong or, or intensive nightmare sufferers because there's about six nightmares per week. And after the treatment, these are the dark uh, ones, um, the, the <clears throat> frequency dropped down to uh, two nightmares per week. And we found this in our studies. If you look at this kind of uh, um, error bars, I think it's called, uh, then you see there's still a lot of error bars or still high. Uh, this is indicating that not all persons are, are benefiting from this uh, um, method. In our, in our experience, it's about 80%, 80 percent of the persons who are willing to do IRT uh, 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 really benefit from it. And this is the study we did. Uh, it's even shorter because we had only 30 minute telephone session. It's a COVID-19 COVID period study. Uh, and uh, and there are two groups in this study, and we follow up the persons eight weeks eight weeks later. And in this half an hour session, uh, the um, master student, it was Katharina Lütt, 
uh, did this IRT and did a practice. They so they uh, recount the dream and uh, they were working together on the dream. And the participants were instructed to work with the, or to continue working for two uh, weeks. And then, if they want, they can use uh, a, a new dream and work with the new dream also for two weeks. And after eight weeks, we we ask them. And you see that for most of them, the nightmare distress, these are the nightmare distress findings, the nightmare distress decreased. For two persons, it increased. But uh, in this case, in both cases, there were additional stressors during this eight-week period. So it was not a, a direct side effect of the treatment, but uh, additional other non-treatment -non related stressors that uh, showed up in this time uh, time period. And if you look at these effect sizes, the last uh, column, uh, then these are high effect sizes. So it was very effectful, the treatment, even if they had nightmares for a long time, one hour of telephone counseling was helpful for most of the persons. Uh, here are a few examples of, the, uh, of this study. For example, I'm driving a car on a highway and I lose control. It's uh, quite a typical dream. The brakes didn't work anymore. And the person um, imagined that she's, she's in the car, sitting in the car. She sees this exit on the right side. Uh, this goes slightly uphill, and she drives into this exit, and uh, we're able to come uh, to a standstill. The second example was a nightmare about a grandmother uh, where uh, was in a house when there was a fire in the house, and the dreamer wasn't able to help her. So she um, imagined that she's taking a cell phone, called the fire department. They came uh, as quickly as possible and um, was able to uh, rescue the grandmother. Uh, so we, uh, the grandmother is thanking the dreamer for this. And they were sitting together and were relieved that everything turned out well. So these are a few examples. This is done in these telephone counseling sessions. Uh, what we were very much astonished in this study uh, was the first uh, the first part of this table is that the persons, many of the persons, uh, because uh, after the first phone call, they hadn't experienced any decrease in nightmares. So they just heard about how we, we explain nightmares, the nightmare model, this, this uh, disposition stress model, and how it's be possible to change nightmares. And this was very astonishing that not only the effect of the treatment was good, but the persons also already, if they had heard about it, that it's possible to do it already, um, uh, <clears throat> um, evaluated this as very helpful. So uh, even after the first session, the persons were very helpful that there's something listening to their nightmares, taking them seriously and thinking and, and suggesting how they can be treated. So this is a very interesting finding of this study that it's not all about I, I must decrease nightmares, but it's all about how uh, we explain nightmares, how the person it's a, her, herself or himself think about nightmares. And this was a very interesting finding. And there's a few meta-analyses out, out there. I think there's a, even a newer one uh, showing that many of these kind of uh, treatments work for nightmare sufferers. And you see here IRT, there's the most studies on that, 500 participants showing that there's a, a significant decrease, lower effect sizes than we had, but uh, uh, we will see whether this can be improved. Uh, the image rehearsal therapy has uh, developed from using with idiopathic nightmares, also with patients with mental disorders, with depression or anxiety disorders. If you want to use in your own practice uh, imagery rehearsal in patients with PTSD, we st strongly recommend it as only to use it as an add-on to a stable standard psychotherapy because the, uh, there's also a finding of Barry Krakow that if you just use IRT as a single technique, many of the participants were not able to confront the, the, the post-traumatic nightmare. So they were so fearful that they were not able to do the imagination uh, of a, um, a changed ending. And there was also a few studies on IRT in children, who's doing drawings and some, something like that, not uh, talking and writing, but doing drawings with um, uh, 
um, nightmares. Uh, that was, as, I, as you might remember, the book of um, Anne Wiseman. She did also work with children and uh, very nice drawings in her book. And there's also a new uh, um, thing to go uh, online or to have web based uh, or app based uh, nightmare therapy, but that's still in development. So the last um, or the second technique for uh, working with nightmares is lucid dreaming because the idea is if you are know that it's a dream because lucid dreams are defined by uh, the knowledge that during the dream that you are dreaming and if you know that the monster you are seeing is just a dream or you're dreaming it uh, and it can't hurt you uh, then you might uh, experience less anxiety and uh, that's it sounds in a theoretical way quite uh, convincing uh, but uh, as you see the problems um, lucid, being lucid doesn't only always mean that you are able to control the dream. So we have termed, or, or some, uh, I think it was Ryan Hurt, uh, coined it to dream lucid nightmares. You know that it's a, it's a dream, but you can't do anything. There, for example, it's a big tiger in your dream and you want to go it away and you say, oh, go away. I know it's a dream. You, you must go away. It's my dream. And the tiger isn't moving, but uh, or is not moving away, but moving towards you. Uh, you might experience more fear than in a normal nightmare. So, um, and my idea, but it's not um, been tested, that if you use IRT, the, the training during the day where you actively uh, uh, think about a new strategy and lucid dreaming, that might be working very good together because uh, the chance to have lucid nightmares will decrease. But it's working. And the main problem, of course, with uh, lucid dream therapy is that most people don't have lucid dreams. Even nightmare sufferers have more lucid dreams than non-nightmare sufferers. They are still very rare, so it's not the first-line treatment. Uh, but if the person is fond of lucid dreaming and want to go into this, uh, you can also use this as a second-line treatment. So the take-home messages are nightmares are common. Everyone had had have um, had had the nightmare, but even the nightmare disorder is relatively frequent, 5% up to 5% in the general population and even higher in persons with mental disorders. Um, the second uh, take home message is the sensitive and creative persons are more prone to nightmares. Nightmares are dramatized stories about everyday emotions. So it's not nothing weird about having nightmares. And uh, nightmares can effectively be coped with. So uh, there are very effective and simple strategies uh, to cope with nightmares. And so the task, especially uh, within the ISD community, is spread the word. So everyone who has nightmares should know that uh, nightmares are normal in a sense, that it's not, not a symptom of uh, being... Uh, totally weird or something. So it's an expression or a dramatized version of um, the day daytime emotions. And if the person is willing to confront and work with the nightmares, uh, he can, he or she can uh, effectively reduce nightmare frequency. And uh, as, as uh, in, in, at least in Germany, but I, uh, I think Ma Michael Nadorf in the US had also similar results. Many people don't know about this. So it's important to inform persons who are interested in dreams or suffer from nightmares to know this. And I want to uh, conclude my talk uh, with a, a slide about uh, Tony Satra's book. He, he should have, have given the talk. Uh, he had written a, a crime mystery novel uh, called The Dream Keepers. And he uh, had put his knowledge about dream and uh, nightmare research into a very thrilling story. And if you want to get nightmares, because one of my colleagues stopped reading the book because it's sometimes very graphic, so you can have can produce nightmares by reading it. Uh, but it's also very interesting uh, stuff if you want to know how nightmare research can influence fiction. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>